Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons, and this month it's being brought to you in particular by Allison Cook, Eric Hervin, Lindsay Marie Trebet, and Super Inframan. Thank you all so very much, and now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have as my guest Mac Maloney. And uh, it's been a while since you've been on, Mac. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's been about a year or so, but glad to be back. And uh, you have a book that came out somewhat recently called Mac Maloney's Haunted Universe. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, it's been out for about, um, not quite a year, and it's a um, kind of a collection of all these just weird, unusual stories that I've, uh, you know, picked up uh, along the way. Um, most, of the, most of them came from research I was doing for other books. They just kind of piled up in my office. So, you know, we just said, why don't we just, you know, put it together in a collection and, uh, you know, put it out not expecting anything. And then it was, uh, it was a bestseller for about six weeks. So oh, that nice. was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I saw, I saw you post about the Facebook, is, which is how I realized you had another nonfiction book, because you mostly concentrate on fiction, right? Right, yep, mm-hmm. yep, mostly, uh, uh, almost entirely fiction. You got three nonfictions now? Um, let's see, we did, um, yeah, this one, and then um, I had done a book um, when I first started out writing many years ago, uh, a nonfiction book on the Alfred Hitchcock TV show. Oh, and, uh, yeah, that was way a long time ago on the Perry Mason TV show. Um, and then we did, um, uh, but more recently did a book called um, UFOs in Wartime, which is, well, the title says it all, really. Yeah. Just reports of uh, UFOs during uh, you know, during wartime. And then we did uh, Beyond Area 51, which is about Area 51 type bases, um, uh, you know, but uh, around the world in different parts of the world. Yeah, we had you on for that one. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I and I absolutely loved that book. Um, and I, I I like this book. It's it's it seems like it was a fun thing for you to do in a sense. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> no, it was, it, was, it was just drudgery. Both of them, really. I say it, but yeah, yeah, it's a drag. I oh. mean, I'll I'll just be honest with you. You know, I mean, um, <laughs> when we do fiction books, you know, when I do a fiction book. You know, I mean, um, you know, I, it all comes, uh, you know, just from, you know, my imagination, let's say, you know. Um, but when you do a nonfiction book, you know, you have to vet everything. You have to get clearances. You have to buy the photos. You have to, it's just, it's, it's, it's 10 times more work. Mm, well, true. Yeah. So it doesn't it seem, doesn't seem like it should be, but it is. <laughs> um, and, and this almost reminds me of like a Charles Fort sort of collection. Like you don't go into a super amount of detail on anything. You kind of just right. bring some of the stuff up, a few things you expand on here and there, but, uh, for the most part, it's a collection. Right. It, it was in, and you know, when I grew up, uh, that's the kind of books I grew up reading, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. especially, uh, flying saucer books, uh, is what they used to call them back then. And, and, they were just these kind of short stories, the short a- anecdotes or whatever, you know. And um, and and I just liked that kind of um, re- writing, you know. I liked that, that the way that that's kind of put together. And 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 the, and people have told me that they said, you know, in this and the other books that um, you know they read a little <clears throat> snippet or whatever, and then they go on and do their own research, which is great these days. You can just Google all this stuff. So yeah. it's opened up a lot of uh, you know a lot of um, different avenues for people too. Yeah, and there's a bunch of stuff in here I'd never heard of, and that I, I always love that because uh, that doesn't happen a lot anymore with all the stuff I, mm-hmm. I get exposed to. Sure. Um, in your first uh, list, which I think was top ten X military X Files, one of the things you talk about the rock apes of Vietnam, and I had not heard about this before. Right. Yeah, I had neither. Um, you know, I knew I grew up kind of in that era, and I uh, my brother was in Vietnam, and uh, a lot of my friends actually wound up over there. And, you know, they would tell these stories, but, you know, it, they're, they're kind of like, you know, war stories. But um, then, you know, I did a little more research into it when we had the chance to do this book. And there is this kind of um, uh, ape in Southeast Asia, not just in Vietnam, but all throughout. And um, they're more like um, orangutans, I guess. Uh, but they're very smart, and they move in packs. And 
they're very territorial, and there are instances where, uh, you know, U.S. troops just, uh, you know, like came up against these uh, things, and, and like I said, they're, they're, they're just wild animals being very ter- territorial, you know, for their young or whatever, but, you know, they're, they, they're smart enough to throw rocks and to, um, you know, knock down trees on them and stuff, so there's a couple instances in there where the soldiers were surrounded by these things, and they're throwing rocks and boulders at them, and their uh, company commanders tell them, no, don't shoot the apes, don't shoot the animals, you know. It's okay to shoot the humans, but not the animals. So for about an hour or so, you know, they just kind of had to take it until these, this kind of crowd of apes uh, just moved off into the jungle. But kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it definitely resembles Bigfoot accounts as well, but with a different sort of uh, appearance. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I guess uh, you know. I, I'm not sure exactly what the what the, uh, the official name of the ape is, but they said it's uh, you know the very red hair. They're rare, um, but more like uh, orangutans. You know, that was more right. But but large orangutans. Right. Hmm. Um. When in the section you have places to see UFOs, and one of the places was Dyfed Wales, which sounds fairly interesting. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, back, um, that's an interesting place because they had a, a huge uh, UFO um, flap, they used to call them there, uh, years ago, where um, people, first of all, people reported seeing just kind of strangers uh, walking about in weird, uh, you know, uh, clothing, let's say. And then um, people started seeing UFOs, and weird things used to happen, like, um, you know, entire herds of cattle would, you know, wind up, you know, the 10 miles away from where they should be and uh, almost instantaneously and lots of uh, reports of <clears throat> kind of people who look like they might be from UFOs uh, peeking in people's windows and stuff. And this, this all went on in over a six month period. And, and while all this craziness is going on, um, you know, people were just seeing UFOs uh, almost like routinely. So uh, they say, if you go there, even to this day, there's a, there's a number of places in uh, the, um, United Kingdom, let's say, that if, that if you go there, chances are good you're going to see UFO because they show up on a regular basis and have been for years. And and what do you, what do you make of the f- of flap areas? Why do you think there would be certain areas UFOs would show up in and not others? No, yeah, no idea, you know. I mean, we know they exist because, you know, we talk about them, we read about them all the time, you know, um, exactly why UFOs be drawn to, drawn to a certain area. Who knows? I mean, I know one of the other subjects we're going to talk about tonight is this place called the Falkirk Triangle, which is mm-hmm. in Scotland, and um, which uh, is um, there. Uh, there's a there's a there's a village kind of in the middle of it called Bonnie Bridge, Scotland, and that place is there are more UFOs reported there per capita than any place in the world, and um, you know, so people say why, you know, and it, it's just one part of this uh, larger Falkirk Triangle, and also in the Falkirk Triangle is um, the Roslyn Chapel, where the Knights Templar um, are rumored to be buried. There, there are certain instances of the Roslyn Chapel that indicate that the Knights Templar had something to do with it. Mm-hmm. Very strange things. That is a place also that has a lot of UFO reports. And what's also strange about in in, an, in a kind of paranormal history going back a thousand years, going back a thousand years where uh, an entire 1,000 men battalion of Roman soldiers just literally disappeared. This is when the Romans were, you know, had taken over the UK, the British Isles. A thousand guys just disappeared, never found anything from, you know, no evidence or anything. They, you know, they, they were just gone. But anyway, so in this very strange area, not only were all this stuff going on, paranormal and stuff, but people in this area win the national lottery more than anyone else. Yeah, that's so, interesting, that's, too. Figure that out. <laughs> you know, so it has to be connected somehow. We just don't know how. Well, if if, if somehow uh, UFOs are psychic manifestations of some sorts, then it would kind of make sense that they're also winning the lottery more often. They just may well, not, not realize yeah. it, you know? Uh, well, you know, who knows? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, they should build a racetrack there or something. You know, <laughs> someone, someone telling them to do something. Um, what, what, we might as well talk about the rest of the Falkirk Triangle now. Um, and what, are, what other kinds of things have happened there? Well, they, they, you know, like I said, there was this, you know, instance where, uh, this, um, 
Roman legion, thousand guys, just like disappeared. No, not one sign and no, no evidence or anything, which is kind of unusual because you know you would think out of out of a thousand people that you would find something, some kind of evidence, but uh, they never did. Um, there have been reports going way back of uh, you know what we would call these days uh, wolfmen, uh, werewolves. Um, there are uh, you know people who report going. It's a very kind of heavy, heavily forested area, and uh, you know people just like well walking through the forest there, and they'll see the strange lights. Oh, they'll they'll encounter people that you know just don't look like uh, you know from around here. Let's say mm-hmm. um, just a long, long history of um, of this kind of paranormal activity going back you know, hundreds of years. In fact, the quote is, I think we end the chapter on this. Mary Queen of Scots said. Uh, I will never reveal the secrets I found at Roslyn. You know, so it's a nice punchline to end the chapter on. But just one of these hotspots, places like the St. Louis Valley in Colorado, same thing. You know, yeah. all, just yeah. all kinds of strange stuff happening all the time. And, and you mentioned in the 18th century, the residents of Gorebridge saw a city descending from the sky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So that's that's another thing. So so what? When we think about that in 2019, what could that be? That could be just like a huge, U- a, a UFO. really, really UFO. huge UFO. You know? Yeah. Um, you mentioned Gulf Breeze and the fact that there's been a lot of uh, sightings in Gulf Breeze. And, of course, you can't mention Gulf Breeze without mentioning Ed Walters. And what right. do you make of that whole thing? I mean, because a lot of people say he was faking his photographs, but as you point out, uh, other people photographed the same thing. Right, yeah, that's, that's, that's really strange. I mean, uh, yeah, as you say, everyone, you know, Everyone must know about him. He was just, you know, released a bunch of photos way back when that, you know, had this kind of distinct look to, to them and uh, off of Gulf Breeze, uh, Mexico, uh, Florida. But the thing is, is that there's a number of, there's a couple of military bases down there, so they're always flying stuff, you know, down in that area. And, uh, but anyway, so he had these very kind of uh, unique kind of uh, photographs, but then somehow someone found uh, the makings of these things in his attic. Uh, that it, it, it sure looked like he was taking pictures of these things and doing like an early version of photoshopping or whatever. But then after that whole thing was exposed as a hoax, you know, other people started photographing these things that kind of looked like just what he was photographing. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, what the, you know, what's going on here? What, you know, what's, that's kind of strange, you know, think about that. And, and I think there was also some controversy of whether or not the thing that was found, the, the the model that was found, was actually his or someone planted it. Well, you know, it, you know, here we go. You know what I mean? I mean yeah. it, 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 it just would add to it. Um, but it, it is very strange. And, and then he kind of went away, too. So um, it is kind of strange that, that, you know, that you would suddenly see, that you would see UFOs photographed by, you know, innocent bystanders, let's say, that resemble what the hoax was supposed to be. So... Who knows? Um, one of the other places you mentioned is, uh, mentioned is Warminster, England. Right, the place where, yeah, that's that's the place that has been, um, it, it started sometime, in, I believe, in the 50s, I'm not sure, and, and people just started seeing lots of UFOs and, uh, and also uh, you know, hearing strange sounds and, and just seeing a lot of strange activity. It's, it's, it's not that far from Stonehenge. And... Um, uh, and, and they claim that um, you know the, the, where where the uh, up in the Falkirk Triangle, where people see more UFOs than any other place uh, in Warminster. They they claim that there's more paranormal activity. Everything, not just UFOs, but it's just all kinds of strange stuff happening there all the time. And 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 people who live there. In fact, uh, on our own radio show, we have a gentleman who used to live near there, and um, and he says it's it's. It's so routine that you know, people hear the same odd noises at night, and and what kind of noises? It, 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 they just call it the noises, you know, the, the other sounds or something. But it's it's what people people report this type of thing around the world too. And, and I got to tell you, I've actually you know experienced this too. What it sounds like is uh, it sounds like a tractor trailer on a highway, maybe five miles away, that that you hear as if they're they're driving by you. Okay, but but they don't. They don't. They don't drive by you. You hear them, you know, for five minutes, ten minutes at a time, and you say, "Well, if that was really a tractor trailer driving by me on some highway, he'd be he'd be twenty miles away from me now." You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's this kind of mechanical hum, kind of. Uh, people seem to think it, it's kind of like a, a tractor trailer truck that's in low gear, um, 
and, and and like, he, he, but he says, you know, you go there, it's just routine. It's, it's it's part of the whole background now. That's how that's how often it happens. Huh. And and speaking about noises, uh, when you get into Haunted USA, the chapter on Haunted USA, you talk about Alabama's Macalla hum. Right. Yeah. Another thing too. Yeah. There's there's a number of places there's a number of places around the world who have these hums. Uh, a place in England, Bristol, England, they call it the Bristol hum, where certain people uh, hear um, this hum, this low frequency hum. Uh, some of them it it can it drives you crazy. Uh, Taos, New Mexico, also has uh, the Taos hum. Um, out west, uh, people hear it. Same thing. As if. And up in Seattle, we just did a story maybe about a year ago where people up in Washington, out in the middle of nowhere, are hearing these noises that sound like, you know, like there's a large factory nearby. And, um, but no one can ever find out exactly, you know, where it is. And, and I know the one that you, you uh, that mentioned down in Alabama that a, a lot of people will say, witnesses will say the same thing. They'll say, we, it sounds like it's coming, let's say, from the north. So we walk towards the north, and, and, and the, the further we walk, the more it sounds like it's behind us. You know, mm. so you turn around, and, and it's like, and it's maddening in a way, you know. And then it comes and goes, and only certain people can hear it. But the people down in Alabama, that hot town in Alabama, I, I think almost everyone heard it. Interesting. I wasn't familiar yeah. with that one. Um, yeah, it's weird. Let, let's talk about the Sam Louis Valley a little bit. That that place, uh, yeah, that just has tons of weirdness to it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, 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 let's see, it, it's kind of like, well, where, where do you begin? You know, um, <laughs> we, we have a guy on our radio show, Chris O'Brien, which I'm sure you got your audience. Uh, yeah, know. I was ju- uh, I was just going to mention, he, I know he's written about it. He's written about it. He lived there for a long time, and... Um, you know, he, once again, he said that that it it got so kind of routine there that you know people would see him and and they'd say, "Hey, uh, I saw a UFO, you know, or I saw you know something odd about a month ago, and I meant to call you, but it slipped my mind." You know, it's that because just so much stuff happens there. But out in the San Luis Valley, they've seen lots of UFOs, but they've seen things also like flying humanoids. They've seen airplanes uh, disappear and then reappear. They've seen uh, aircraft that are so old, 50, 60 years old, that you know none of them are flying around the world anymore. Um, uh, they have found animals there that that uh, commonly do not come any. They don't come any more north than the southern Mexico border. Mm. Um, they have shadow people there. You know, shadow people, which you know, people are in their homes and they'll see the shadow of someone on the wall, but there's no one else in. Uh, you know, in the house with them, which uh, uh, for me is particularly scary. But w- w- and, and a whole host of different things. I mean, Chris O'Brien has written like three or four books with all the crazy stuff that's going on out there. But um, the one unusual thing out there, and this is you know for any kind of um, debunkers or naysayers, is there's a um, small town out there uh, that has a cemetery that for years people have reported seeing strange lights hovering over this little cemetery. And now this is in the southwest corner of Colorado, and um, uh, and so one night, uh, the everyone in the town is uh, maybe a couple thousand people in this town. They agreed to shut their lights off because they're wondering, well, maybe this is some kind of reflection, a glare, or whatever. So one night, everyone shut their lights off, and they went out and they could see the lights over the graveyard. You know, so you know what's up with that? Hmm. So yeah, very strange. And um, and 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 as Chris will point out, you know, one of the the elements that makes a hot spot is, um, by his criteria, and it's a good one, is that you know there's some kind of military activity nearby. But if you look at the a map of the St. Louis Valley, there are five military bases around it. Two of them are highly secret. One of them is NARAD, and um, and it also on the western part of it is a uh, open um, weapons and weapons testing range. So if they're going to be flying anything weird, it'll be out there. But um, yeah, so who knows? You know, once again, I mean, Chris, he thinks, you know, the continental divide is near there, and there has been reports that, you know, when plate tectonics hit each other and they create this strange kind of energy and the right. UFOs around those all the time. You know, so who knows? We don't know, you know. And you also mentioned invisible slug like creatures that invade people's homes. Yeah, right. Yeah, those kind of, once again, it's kind of like you can't, you can't. You see them, you see their trails, you see like, they're almost like big snails or something, and you see their, you, you see
see their shadows and you can see, you know, if they brush by something, it, you know, that, they're, that there's something there, yet, you know, you can't see anything. Animals react to them, uh, but uh, humans don't. Huh. If I lived there, I'd move. I'd move out of there. There's just too much crazy <laughs> stuff going on. Um, you have uh, from Connecticut. I wrote down strange, weird screams in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Um, well, you know, Connecticut is kind of a funny state anyway because most people just kind of like drive through it but, right. uh, on the way to New York or out of New York. But, um, yeah, that's, it's just one of these things. Once again, it's these things that you, you find out that They've been happening for years, but you don't realize it until, you know, you just kind of look into it. But, you know, people for years have been reported, especially in the south, once again, the southwestern part of Connecticut, as you're getting kind of close to New York City, you know, they hear people screaming in the woods and just like kind of noises at night, always at night. And, you know, it's always the same story. They went to investigate them and, um, you know, there's nothing there. And then you hear the screams again. And, you know, the police have been involved, but they, you know, because it sounds like someone's getting, you know, murdered or whatever. You can never find anything. And this is, once again, these kind of local stories that are routine to the people who, you know, live in the area. But, you know, people like us, this is the first time we're hearing about it. Yeah. Yeah, the screaming was definitely something that would be unnerving. Yes, yeah, I agree with you. I agree. I mean, and, and not even for a paranormal aspect, but just that you would think somebody's in trouble, you know? Someone's in trouble, yeah, right. Well, that's, how, you know, that's the thing is that so the cops get involved, and, you know, so they, they got to go out and look, you know? That's their job, so I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> and that, that to me would be unnerving, hearing someone screaming, you can't <laughs> find the source of it. Um, and then just, you know, a little bit down the line from that, in Massachusetts, you have the Bridgewater Triangle. Right, yeah. The Bridgewater Triangle is, um, we're in Massachusetts, but it's in the, um, it's kind of the south, um, once again, the southwestern part of the state a little bit. It's a uh, large area, large forested area. Um, there's, it's it's in the middle of kind of like a habitat area, like Bridgewater University is down there, and there's a, there's a, a, a lot of, you know, kind of towns around it, but this is kind of like a, a, a spot right in the middle of them all. And back then, I mean, once again, for years, people have been seeing odd things there, lights and UFOs and Bigfoot and so on and so forth. But uh, one thing that people have, have sw- they swear they've seen this thing on a number of times, and this is, you know, recently, is that they see something that they um, describe as a pterodactyl, like, you know, like a prehistoric bird flying around out there. Um, they see people, and the people on the edges of it, you know, will see people in the, just right on the border of this place, uh, that look like they're from a different time, and they're calling to them, calling to them for help and stuff, and to come come help me, and, you know, really creepy stuff like that. Hmm. But, um, yeah, the Bridgewater Triangle, and, and there's been a number of murders in there and so on. It's it's kind of, you know, the kind of place you'd go dump a body, if you know what I mean. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I, I've heard about Bridgewater for a while, but I've never really, like, had anyone who was an expert on it or anything on the show. I, don't, I always wanted to. Yeah, it's crazy there. Yeah. Uh, in Nebraska, you talk about an old story from Nebraska from 1884 that you labeled Cowboys and Aliens. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Um, you know, a story that just um, yeah, someone found in a, um, a newspaper back then where these um, cowboys were out, you know, wrangling, you know, a uh, herd of cattle, and they saw this thing crash, and... Um, and, you know, from their reports, and this is their reports that showed up in a newspaper like 40 miles away, like a week later. And that's how the news traveled back then. And, um, you know, it sounds like uh, your typical UFO crash. You know? um, um, three, I think three or four cowboys saw it, and then some other person saw it. And then um, a newspaper editor uh, came out to the spot, if I, if I have the story correct. And, uh, but what had happened in between was... Uh, it had rained, and what they said was when the rain hit the, the wreckage of this thing, it all turned to salt and then, boom, blew away. Um, <laughs> and I think they, the reporter might have seen the pile of salt, which is interesting. Um, but, um, yeah, yep, Cowboys and Aliens, who knew? <laughs> I think there's a movie called that. Yeah, I think so. They should make a movie of it, right. <laughs> um and the last one in the, in the, the states, uh, or the fifth, uh, you basically took a story from every state in this chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, 
another word I've never heard of is the mystery shirts that uh, happen in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Well, once again, you know, if you've ever been to New Jersey, I don't know how much of a mystery this is, but, um, you know, along uh, one of the turnpikes down there, for some reason, someone just would hang like perfectly ironed, perfectly laundered men's white business shirts in, uh, in the trees uh, off of this highway in this little town. And um, no one would ever see them do it. Uh, sometimes the shirts would be changed. Sometimes there'd be a n- different number of them or whatever. But, and, you know, what's it mean? You know, who knows what it means. But, but you know, it's something that went on for a while. Huh. Yeah, it, it's just a weird, weird thing. You said they were like 20 feet up in the air, too. Right, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, well, who went through all the trouble to do this? <laughs> you know, it's an odd thing to do. You'd have to get a ladder. You'd have to get it. You know, you'd have to go to New Jersey. You'd have to get a bunch of shirts <laughs> and hangers and and what a cherry picker or something. Put them up there. No one's going to see you doing it. And if you're trying to make a point, uh, it's it's kind of an obscure one. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, so you have a chapter here on mystery sounds, and these have always kind of fascinated me. Um, you start off with quackers, and I was not familiar with this. This is uh, from the Soviet submarines initially back in like seventy five. Uh, right. Um, you know, the, the the whole world of kind of like underwater, you know, warfare with submarines and sensors and all this kind of stuff, it's a whole different kind of universe, you know. And and the strange thing is that, um, you know, the way that noise is conducted through water, especially in the ocean, you can hear stuff going on, if you have the right equipment, you can hear stuff going on, you know, literally thousands of miles away. So... Um, the Soviet Union, um, you know, back in the 70s, um, when, when, they, when they had the technology where you could record the noises of, um, like, for instance, every, every U.S. Navy ship, every sh- military ship in the world, probably every ship in the world, has its own unique sound. So they started building these kind of sonar devices that, you know, they could hear a sound a thousand miles away and they could tell that it was the USS Nimitz, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's how sensitive it was. So in the middle of, you know, trolling all over the place, uh, trying to pick up U.S. sounds of U.S. naval warships, they started hearing these very strange things. Um, they call them uh, quackers. And it, 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 I know one of them sounds just like nothing more than like a, in, an enormous, gigantic duck quacking. Um, and and then they have other kind of odd sounds too. Uh, they they almost sound like whale sounds in a way, but uh, the Russians determined that uh, whatever they were, they were coming from like down off of um, the really kind of south south Pacific off off of um, South America, and they were coming from very very deep in the ocean, way deeper than any submarine or anything like that uh, could dive, um, deeper than they would think that any kind of large animal or, or whatever would be able to survive at such depths. But that's where they were coming from. I think there was five or six of them. Uh, these are the ones at least we put in there, and, you know, there's probably more. Uh, but what they are, no one knows. Hmm. Um, there's there's one here that uh, actually has, has been reported in my area in the Finger Lakes uh, called mist puffers, and I've never heard them called that. Usually mm-hmm. I hear them called things like the, the, like the cannons of the Finger Lakes or whatever, but they go mm-hmm. back before to Native American culture and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, the same thing. You know, people, you know, sometimes people describe them as, uh, as you say, cannon fire going off in the distance or thunderstorms, you know, when, you know, there's, there's no clouds around. Um, uh, people have been hearing it for years. Uh, I know that the uh, Native Americans, you know, would say that, you know, that's just uh, Mother Earth, you know, kind of, you know, building herself. Um but, you know, once again, it's just like a lot of things in the book. You know, there's just odd things happen a lot. People hear them a lot, but there's just no... People see them, hear them, experience stuff, uh, but there's no explanation for any of them. They're just mysteries. And uh, the other one in this chapter I was, I'm really interested in was the Heavenly Horns, which happened in January 2018. Mm-hmm. Right, just for whatever reason. Uh, this is another one that really kind of creeps me out, frankly. Um on that date, uh, around the world, people reported hearing, you know, what could only be described as like trumpets from the sky, um, and they recorded them. And uh, 
almost the same sound like in Poland and France and New Orleans, I think it happened. Um, it, 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 you know, what was it? Who knows? You know, there's, there's, I've seen videotapes of uh, forest workers in Quebec, uh, you know, out in the middle of the forest, forests that are so deep that, you know, there are parts of Quebec that aren't even charted yet. That's how, you know, out in the middle of know you, where you are. And, and, and they would hear these trumpeting sounds. You know, where, where are they coming from? Yeah. There's no one around for, for, for probably 100 miles. And if it's a hoax, why would anyone go through, you know, such an yeah. elaborate yeah. hoax, you know? I mean, it seems like there might be a natural explanation somewhere there that we're just something we don't normally, you know, one of those things that only happens once in a great while, so we don't mm-hmm. have previous record, records of it. Who knows? But, but, you know, odd that it would all happen on the same day around the world. That's yeah. very, that sort of shows you some kind of coordination on or, well, uh, some kind of intelligence behind it. Or something cosmic, you know, like if cer- a certain type of cosmic ray hit the Earth on that day right, and, yeah. and caused a reaction that turned out sounding like trumpets. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't know how most of this stuff works. Right, right. Um, but, yeah, weird noises like that. I mean, I, f- I feel like when you have a history of them, it's more interesting mm-hmm. than when they've just started recently because of all our technology, all the stuff we, you know, the electromagnetic fields, the cell phone towers, uh, everything else sure. we're pumping into the atmosphere, plus who knows what the military is doing. Yep. yep. You know, it's harder to limit it down as a truly weird thing nowadays, but when you look back and you say, oh, the Native American cultures also had a name for this. Mm-hmm. Right, sure. You know, and that's that's one of the reasons why I believe in, in, in Bigfoot, because or that there's something out there, because um, I, someone told me this once, um, that um, up in the northwestern part of the United States, there's something like um, 175 different Native American tribes, traditionally, right? Mm-hmm. And the way Native American culture goes, and I'm no expert, but, you know, once again, uh, you know, someone told me this, is that the Native Americans, they didn't make up creatures, okay? Right. They didn't make them up. You know, what they what they would do is it would be, uh, you know, a hush with wings, a giant fox, you know, a bear that spoke, you know. It wasn't like some, you know, they, that, there were no dinosaurs in their mythology, you know. Mm-hmm. But of those 175 different tribes that have been up there for, you know, millennia, um, I think he said 160 of them had a word for what we would call, you know, Sasquatch. So, you know, they only recorded things they saw. They didn't, you know, in their imaginations or whatever, they didn't make stuff up. So, yeah. you know, so they saw something. They saw what we call Bigfoot. And, and so much of this stuff, I mean, we may not understand what it is and our assumptions right. about what they are might be wrong, but when you have historical records of things like ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, going back as far as we have recorded records, there's something going on. People are experiencing something. It's not just, you know, everyone making it up for the length right. of human history, you know? Right, right. It all it, it can't all be hoaxes, and if one of them is true, then they're all true in a way, you know? Um, right, right. The, um, you know, especially, you know, with, with Bigfoot, which is, you know, like all these things, they all have their, a lot of noise around them. But um, but I, I just remember seeing a long time ago, well, you know, 20 years ago, like on a travel channel or something, where this guy was a Bigfoot hunter, and he um, took the National Geographic film crew with him uh, to go to a place where Bigfoot sightings, you know, were... Uh, had been uh, reported in the past, right? So what they do is they trudge through these woods up in Washington State for two hours. They walk into the woods for two hours, and they come to the stream, and you can see that there are what look like very large humanoid footprints in the mud, right? Like someone that would, some creature's been there within the past hour or so. And you have to ask yourself, who would go through that? <laughs> just for a hoax, you know what oh, I mean? Right, right. Uh, you know, and how would they know the camera crew is coming? And uh, you, you can be sure National Geographic, they're, you know, on the up and up. They're not going to fall for some, you know, hokey hoax. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, so so where do those, you know, where do those footprints come from? It's impossible that anyone is pranking these people. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, 
it, it, they may not be what we think they are. I mean, some Native American culture, a lot of Native American cultures account, uh, attribute them to the spirit world. Um, sure, yeah. But uh, th- there's definitely a phenomena there. Right. Uh, and just, you know, just w- one last quick story, that, you know, that, that it kind of hits home uh, for me was uh, back when I was in college, I, I saw uh, um, Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, mm-hmm. you know, give a lecture. And he's like, he's one of the greatest science fiction writers ever and is a really smart, smart guy. And at the end of the lecture, he took questions, and someone said, you know, besides the automobile and the airplane, you know, the the most obvious stuff, what's your favorite invention? And he said, the lightning rod. And he said, this is why. All it is, it's a simple piece of metal. Um, You put it on top of your house, and your house doesn't get hit by lightning anymore. It, It discharges the charge, let's say. He said, before that, if your house got hit by lightning, you know, you were at, at, at best branded a witch and, you know, you were run out of town. You know, this was God's finger coming down on you and burning your house down and because you must have done something wrong. And this thin piece of metal took all, the, all, all that nonsense out of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's a great invention. Now, we think UFOs are crafts with people from outer space, you know, flying them. We think... You know, Bigfoot is, you know, is some lost kind of, uh, you know, DNA cousin of ours. We think, you know, the Loch Ness Monster is a big monster. We think all these things, but, as you say, there's a good chance there's going to be something that we can't conceive of yet. Yeah. And that would, be, that would help explain why we haven't figured it out yet, why we don't have a Bigfoot body, why, you know, we don't have empirical evidence of space aliens. We, we don't have any crash UFOs either. I hate to be the, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, 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 you know, the guy who ruins the party. But, you know, there's a lot of noise out there. And, you know, not to plug my own trouble, we do a show every week, Mac Money's Military X-Files. And what we talk about is that, you know, it, we, we, it would be impossible for us it, to live in a world where uh, the U.S. government had you know, any kind of access to any kind of extraterrestrial uh, technology, not of this earth, because we would be living in a different world. Yeah. We would be living in a different world. It's as simple as that. If we had even just the slightest idea of how a UFO worked, or if we had any kind of, you know, reverse engineered stuff from UFOs, um, you wouldn't be launching the space shuttle. Right, you know, right. Uh, right. you know, like launching a dump truck at the whole of it. I always say you wouldn't go through that. <laughs> you, you you wouldn't go through all this, you know, building these, you know, uh, you know the B twos and the F thirty fives and this just unbelievable military machine that that we've that we've built. You, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't have ballistic rifles. You know what I mean? You wouldn't have jet engines. Um, so they don't have anything. U.S. military has. They know UFOs exist. They have plenty of evidence that they exist, but they don't know what they are any more than, than we do. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, the the argument against that is also that there's a secret space program, and, uh, you know, the main space program is just a decoy. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, once again, uh, you know, why would you do that? Why, what, you know, what are you doing? I know that uh, we've had people on the show that claim that they're, we have this secret space force and it's flying around out in the... In, solar system and so on and so forth, you know, what are they doing out there? Who knows? But you would have to think of the logistics that would be, have to be involved with something like that. You would literally have to have something akin to a gigantic uh, Cape Canaveral launching all this stuff. You would have to have every uh, country in the world in on it because uh, these days even little, little countries have radar that can, they can see what's going on in orbit. You have the, the International Space Station up there. They would, you know, there's Russians on there. They are friends. You know, are they going to be in on this conspiracy, seeing us in our secret space mm-hmm, ship mm-hmm. flying all over the place? You know, it, it just, and, and, you know, someone, you know, if you're part of the Space Force or part of the logistics or whatever, all these years no one has said one word. You know, no one, none of these spaceships have crashed or malfunctioned or someone wanted to sell their story to 60 minutes you know it, 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 it it's nonsense frankly yeah um you you have a couple chapters in here uh what was the one the one was on, on stupid spies which was pretty amusing and you have one on uh what was the other one there 
Yeah, Worst Spies Ever is one of them. Mm-hmm. Right, And yeah. uh, tw- 12 Really Bad Military Ideas, those are pretty entertaining. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I want to go on to one of the ones in your chapter, The Unexplained, which talks about a ghost blimp, Love 8. Mm-hmm. Right. These are one of the, this is one of those stories that, you know, as, as a kid, it was on a show called, um, I think it's called One Step Beyond, where they would do mm. kind of true stories, true weird stories. I might be, ha- I might have the show wrong, but you know, there were shows, you know, way back when that were just kind of like uh, strange but true type stuff. And then basically what this was, was the U.S. Navy blimp, um, which um, were, they were gigantic. They were these you know, obviously huge gas bags that would carry this little gondola underneath, and um, they would just kind of float along. And they were really useful for like checking for enemy submarines and stuff. So this one was up in San Francisco Bay during World War II, and they would send these um, blimps out to just uh, fly over the water, and they'd be able to look straight down and see uh, a submerged submarine. And that's what they were doing, and they were out for a couple hours, and people saw them. Lots of people saw them, different airplanes and people on land and so on. And they uh, said that they thought that they saw a possible uh, submarine somewhere in San Francisco Bay. And they went down, and they dropped flares on it, and, uh, some kind of buoy, I believe. And people saw them doing this, and um, and that was the last report they got from this uh uh, from this blimp, and uh, people saw uh, they saw the blimp uh, uh, kind of like rise in altitude. It went over a number of ships, went over past San Francisco, the, the Golden Gate Bridge, went past a, a number of airplanes, uh, but they couldn't raise it on the uh, radio. And then it finally came, um, made land, and and uh, kind of like crashed in this uh, small town uh, north of San Francisco, and the guy, and there was no one ab- on board. Um, yeah, there was. Yeah, there's no one aboard, and and but people swear they saw this thing under kind of human control, right up until the end. So, hmm. why they weren't on board, and, and how this thing flew with them not on board, uh, they've never found out. And I think, and the Navy it spent a year questioning people and trying to go through it, and 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 you know, their the Navy's conclusion was that this is inconclusive. Yeah. I can tell you, it's just the military, they don't use that word too often. They'll lie before they use that word. Right, right. Um, you, you talk about something called the scare ships, and this, this came on the end of the uh, the airship wave um, in the early 1900s. Right. Um, the scare ships were, um, uh, they, as you say, there was, a, there was definitely an airship wave in, this, in the United States and also overseas in the late 1800s. And, um, in fact, one of them was, uh, a photograph was taken of an airship in Lynn, Massachusetts, which is uh, only about maybe 20 minutes uh, south of where we are right now. And so these things were flying around. No one ever knew really what they were. But in 1909, in England, um, people started seeing these enormous uh, airships. They looked more like Zeppelins, but they were much bigger. And um, for a number of reasons, they weren't Zeppelins. But people would see them for about six months. Um, lots of people would see them. There were more than one because people would see them in formations. People would see yeah, report them in different uh, parts of the country and so on. Uh, the reason they weren't Zeppelins, even though a lot of people suspected they were Zeppelins, was that in 1909, uh, the only Zeppelin, the Zeppelins were uh, the German military's blimp, war blimps, basically. Um, they could only uh, do tethered flight. They could only fly with uh, a cord, uh, you know, keeping them on the ground, or keeping them attached mm. to the ground. Um, they could not, there's no way they could make uh, the journey down from Germany. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of aerodynamic forces that are against you doing this trip, like the prevailing winds would be against you. Uh, you know, it's kind of rocky um, wind-wise when you're going over the English Channel. You'd, you'd, you know, then for some reason you'd come over to the, the British Islands. A lot of people see you because these things are seen at night, but they had huge searchlights you know, on their bottoms, kind of looking for something on the ground. That's not something that you would do if you were a spy blimp. Um, so even even um, uh, the people, even Von Zeppelin, the guy who invented Zeppelin, said, you know, it wasn't us. His, his quote was, um, I don't believe in ghosts, is how he put it. But um, <laughs> so, then they, so then they kind of went away. Then they, um, yeah, they kind of went away. But some people saw them and tracked them at uh, more than 
250 miles an hour. Now, yeah. even today, these uh, even today's blimps, there are some around, can't go more than, you know, never in a straight line, you know. Um, but they know that this, uh, because in this one case with the scare ships, uh, the press was all over this, and so they had reporters at all these different cities, and uh, when they saw a scare ship, they would, you know, mark the time and so on in its direction, and there'd be someone 40 miles away at another city, and they would see this thing coming, and then they would do the triangulation or however. You, you'd do the math, and you would figure out that this thing, to make it from point A to point B, with witnesses seeing this, it had to be going about 20 to 50 miles an hour, and that's very fast, yeah. far up yeah. and, and, for an airship. You, you dropped out for a minute. What was uh, How fast do you say that we can... Uh, about 250 miles an hour. No, I mean now, our stuff. Oh, now, uh, probably 50, 60, okay. if that, you know, and... and and, and, you know, blimps don't go in straight lines, you know. Um, right. They, you're at the mercy of, of the winds, and, and you're kind of like fighting against the wind the whole time. So, um, you know, to have something that big going that fast back then, you know, it's, it's just impossible in a way. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, you also in the same chapter talk about the ghost flyers, and this, this was one night, one night in November 1933 it started. Right, right. The, the ghost flyers were um, you know, these very unusual aircraft that people uh, in the northern part of Sweden, up near the Arctic Circle, started seeing uh, you know, in the early 30s. And what they looked like was a very large uh, plane that had a, a twin tail on it, like a P-38, if people are familiar with uh, World War II airplanes, twin tail, eight engines, but pontoons indicating that it would, it's some kind of a uh, airplane that lands on water, even though when people would see these things, they were hundreds of miles away from water, and, and, and that water being like the Arctic Ocean. Um, mm-hmm. Once again, they had searchlights. They would do very odd things. They would circle mountains for hours. People would see them circling mountains. Uh, they, would, they would circle little villages. They would shut their engines off and coast, circle, circle, and start their engines on again. Um, lots of people saw them. They started in Sweden, but they spread out all over Scandinavia. Now, this is like in the early 30s when even seeing an, air, an airplane is a big deal. Uh, to see one of these things, uh, people had no idea what they were. And then, once again, they kind of went away, um, and no one ever came forward and said, gee, you know, uh, we were behind, uh, you know, the ghost flyers. You know, we were... <clears throat> They're right. actually German right. secret weapons or something. You know, no evidence or ever found them, where they were built, who flew them, who fueled them, nothing. Hmm. And and both of those stories, I mean, it seems like they are uh, UFO sightings, basically, but of a, of a different type, like we're projecting right. a different image onto the UFO at that point. Right, exactly. Um, the, the third one, the, the troika in this, is in 1946, after World War II, there were things called the ghost rockets in the same parts mm-hmm. of Sweden and Scandinavia where people were seeing these rockets going overhead, um, sometimes singly, sometimes in formation, you know, a bunch at a time. And at first people thought that uh, these were um, German uh, buzz bombs uh, V1s and V2s that the Russians had taken over because the Russians had taken over the German main uh, V2 and uh, V1 rocket base at Pinamunde, and um, the Russians had taken it over, and they thought, hey, they must be you know, launching these things secretly from there. But as it turns out, the Russians actually took over everything at this Nazi uh, rocket base and moved it back to Russia. There was yeah. nothing left at per- Pinamunde, so it wasn't that. So this got to be so concerning that the... Swedish government, which is always officially neutral, actually through back channels asked uh, the British for some air defense radar. The British provided it to them. And now for the first time, what, what, what that did was people were seeing these things, you know, uh, visually, but they were also being picked up on radar. Uh, so they were, there was something there. You know, they weren't, you know, hallucinations or, you know, light flashes or whatever. There's something there. And um, when one of these... Um, Oh, a, a, a Swedish one, and his his description of it is almost the description perfectly of uh, a present day Tomahawk cruise missile. So, mm. what we're talking about is you know, with the scare ships, with the ghost flies, and the and the ghost uh, rocket. It seems, as you say, it's UFOs, but it seems like 
it's something a little bit out of time, you know, or, yeah. or from a different time or from a different place that's almost like us, you know. Yeah. You get a lot of that. It seems to be just ahead of where we actually are. Oh, oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, something is just a bit off, <laughs> you know. And, and who knows what that is? It could be the universe next door or something. Mm, yeah. Um, and I know, like, John Keel reported cases of, like, normal-looking airplanes doing things that normal-looking airplanes don't do. Mm. You know, and, right. and and it's yep. like, what, what's that? You know, uh, but talking yep. about John Keel, you have a, a you do a thing on uh, celebrity UFO sightings. You mentioned J- Dan Aykroyd, uh, mm-hmm. didn't uh, who was who was really into this stuff. Yep. Uh, had woken up in the middle of the night when and back in the eighties, saying they are calling me. I want to I want to go outside, and his wife told him to go back to sleep. Yeah. And uh, it said uh, people all, all over upstate New York had the same sur- urge to go outside at 3 in the morning. Those who heeded the call saw a tremendously large pink spiral object hovering in the sky. Mm-hmm. And that's really interesting because uh, we were just talking last week with uh, Brent Rains and John Keel had always said that if you want to see a UFO, the best time to do it is 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, uh, at the time, he was uh, still on Saturday Night Live. He's very much into, uh, you know, UFOs and stuff. And um, he, you know, was one of these people who, and he's not the only one, who felt that he, that he had this calling to go out and to look at this thing. And I guess he used to do it a lot and see nothing, so that's why his wife said, you know, just stay in bed, you know. So he didn't do it, but a lot of other people did, and they were they seemed to be compelled to see this thing, and, and they saw this huge, as you say, pink kind of thing swirling in the air. Now, that, as you know, because this is your neighborhood, uh, you know, the uh, Hudson Valley sightings were right in that general area where yep. people would see these enormous, enormous kind of craft coming down the Hudson River, uh, so much so that people would stop along the Taconic Parkway, which is a parkway right that you know, goes a little parallels the river, and they would stop there and just watch these things, you know. So yep. it's an odd place, you know. It's I don't know if you call it a hot spot or not, but a lot of things have happened just in that uh, that that area. Um. So in your chapter, ghosts and airplanes, you talk about a phenomena called the galloping ghosts of Nansei Shoto. Mm-hmm. Right. This is something that was uh, at the end of um, World War Two. Uh, so. The way that the um, United States, you know, beat Japan uh, was it was basically through naval action, and uh, they surrounded Japan with submarines, uh, which would just torpedo anything coming in through Japan, and and basically, you know, put them in a position where they had to uh, think about surrender, and then they dropped the bomb and boom. So, uh, so, so Japan was. Surrounded by U.S. subs, let's put it that way, towards the end of the war. But what happened in this particular place south of Japan, Japan has all these like many little islands in the southern part. And uh, U.S. Navy ships would go through these islands, and there was just one particular strait near there where on radar and so on, they would, they would see like these ghost images of like as if there's a huge air armada coming to uh, attack them, or that there were submarines underneath them, or it would just make the detection equipment on U.S. Navy ships uh, go crazy and make it seem like, you know, all kinds of crazy things were kind of ha- going to happen to them and so on. Um, you know, phantom enemies and stuff. So, And why it happened in this particular part of the world at this particular time, who knows? But you know, a lot of people uh, reported it. Hmm. Um, let, let's jump over to the M triangle. And I, I we may have touched on this uh, when I had you on last time, but that was a few years ago. Uh, so this is in Russia? It's in Russia. It's in uh, the Ural Mountains, and um, which is kind of like their Rocky Mountains, let's say. Um, it's an uh, area that is a, um, it's forested, but it's not a heavily forested. Lots of uh, fields and streams and rivers and so on. Um, almost like a nature preserve, maybe. But uh, during the Soviet Union times, um, People were, and journalists particularly, were not allowed to go into it. Uh, Lots of people saw the Russian uh, KGB and military activity going in and out of the place, but, um, you know, no one ever really said what that was about. Once again, traditionally, people used to, people have seen strange things happening in the M-Triangle, so much so that they 
have like old carvings of what you know look like maybe aliens or UFOs or whatever. So anyway, when you, what happens is when the Soviet Union fell, uh, they did open up a little bit and they would allow these kind of um, uh, expeditions into the M Triangle with scientists and so on, and they brought some journalists along uh, in the beginning. So what people will report is that um, you would go in there and you would have this uh, kind of, a lot of people would have this sense of well-being that, like they had never felt before. Uh, the animals come right up to you and eat out of your hand. There's no, like, fear of humans. Uh, same thing with the fish. Uh, people see UFOs all the time. People say they see the stars dancing at night there. Uh, you go into the woods and um, people hear traffic, like the strange noises we were talking about earlier. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a place called the, the Call Box. Now, this is really strange. Just on the middle of nowhere, there's no phone service unless you stand in this, like, you know, square, three-square-foot area, uh, and you can call anywhere in the world. Um, it goes on and on and on and on. People, you know, have gone in there with, with horrible diseases, and they come out cured. Um, for about 90% of the people, it's a positive experience. A lot of people go in there for two weeks. So anyway... Um, the, uh, the 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 information that we put in the book came from a lot of it came from this People magazine uh, reporter who went in uh, to the M Triangle in the nineties um, with this group of people and one of the people who was in her group uh, was this guy who was um, a Russian citizen of Moscow. He got drummed out of the, the 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 Russian army, which, believe me, is a hard thing to do because they'll take anybody. <laughs> uh, but he got drummed out. He somehow gets a job as a journalist. He goes in with this expedition along with the People magazine person. And that, so they both see all this kind of crazy, wonderful stuff happens. And the person from People magazine is reporting it. Now, this Russian went back to Moscow, did his story. And then in the next year or so, he all of a sudden started finding that he had this kind of unknown uh, knowledge of, uh, like, um, uh, astrophysics. Hmm. Um, Never studied it or anything, and and within a year of it, he was a cosmonaut. Wow. Now, what's, you know what I mean? What's with that? That's crazy. Uh, But it happened. It it, it was reported in People magazine, so we got to believe it, you know. (laughs) <laughs> that's the type of stuff that you see happening after people have near-death experiences. Uh, so, yeah, something, something, something. You know, and so a lot of people say, well, if there's heaven on earth, this is the place. Hmm. Um, let's go to ghost ships, and you talk about the Orang Madan, which uh, is definitely a creepy story. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep, that was a, um, this took place down in, um, the, yeah, down in the Pacific, I think, uh, around Indonesia, down around there. And um, uh, what happened was uh, ships in this uh, particular area started getting mayday calls from uh, the ship. And, you know, there's various uh, stories, but they, they, people uh, sending out the mayday were saying stuff like, come quick, whatever. And, you know, the, the, the rule of the sea is if someone puts out a mayday, you don't, you know, you, you don't screw around. You know what I mean? You, mm-hmm. you don't. It's serious. No matter where you are, no matter who you are. You have to go and help that person. That's just the law of the sea, right? So these ships show up, and they, and they find this um, freighter, and they go aboard it, and, and everyone on it is dead. Um, and I think there's maybe 11 people in the crew or whatever. Um, they're all dead. I mean, some stories say that you know, some of them would look like they were frightened to death and so on and so forth. But as the search party is like, going through this thing, all of a sudden it catches on fire. Uh, the search party... You know, gets off just in time. The thing kind of like, you know, blows up, catches on fire and sinks right in front of them. And and no one has any idea whatever happened. What No one knows what happened. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's just bizarre. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you have a chapter in here on NASA conspiracies, and they're all pretty good. Uh, what are your favorite uh, NASA conspiracies? Well... And it, it's hard to say, you know. Um, see, here's the thing about NASA, and going back to the secret space program in a way. You know, the, the the record of NASA, even though they put us on the moon and so on and so forth, they've done some great things. They've done some not-so-great things. You know, they're not this well-oiled machine. Um, so why would they have this kind of secret space force unless they're really duping us all? But, you know, there's, there's things like... Um, 
you know, there was a while there after the Challenger accident that uh, we couldn't launch anything. I mean, you know, things kept failing. They sent, you know, a few probes to Mars and stuff like that, and they just, you know, disappeared. And, um, you know, there was one where they were sending this probe to Mars that cost like a couple billion dollars. That's a couple billion dollars. I think it's called the Mars Polar Lander. Oh, yeah. And yeah. and what it was was it was two spacecraft. One thing to get it halfway to where it is going and then halfway to Mars, the other spacecraft kind of takes over. And that can, that contains the lander and so on and so forth. Well, if you want to believe them, halfway across, they found out that one half of the it turns out that one half of it was done by, you know, measurements in inches and feet and stuff, and the other half was done by centimeters and so on. And if you want to believe the story, neither side knew that they were doing this. Neither side checked before they launched this $2 billion <laughs> thing to Mars, and it was never heard from again. I mean, to me, that just seems like, wow. You know, at the very least, it was a huge, huge mistake. I, I just can't believe. All the stuff that they that they go through to build these um, landers, they're not just building these things. They have to be built in clean rooms and stuff because they mm -hmm. don't want us to bring uh, microbes and all that jazz. Yeah. yeah it, it really, no one checked to see that this half is done by U.S. measurements and this <laughs> one is done by... Uh, really? So it's stuff like that. It's stuff like that. So either they're pulling the wool over all of our eyes you know, by making us think that they're stupid and they're doing a good job at it, or I don't know. And what, what do you think about the moon landing stuff? You know, moon landing, they landed on the moon, and then you know, the whole idea that they didn't land on the moon is just, you know, once again, that's crazy. You know, they landed on the moon, because if it was a, a conspiracy, then once again, you cannot keep anything quiet these days. You know, you can't do it. Even the guys who whacked bin Laden, who, who signed non-disclosure agreements, security agreements and stuff, they're making movies, you know, writing books. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, if someone had conclusive proof, definite proof, that you didn't land on the moon, we would have known it a long time ago. So they landed on the moon. They landed on the, the anything with NASA, in my opinion, is that they're they're, they're this huge, huge kind of bureaucracy, kind of bulging, and they and they do great stuff despite themselves. <laughs> Well, I don't, you know, I don't think it's impossible that they could have filmed footage of them landing on the moon in case something went wrong. Yeah, but they would, yeah. I don't think they're that smart. I don't think that they're that devious, you know. <laughs> I think they just kind of rumble ahead, um, you know, and um, uh, they, 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 wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. You know, if, if that was the case, then they would have faked the whole Apollo 13 thing. Hmm. Fair enough. Okay. You know, this happened. To, I, I happened to talk to um, uh, one of the astronauts uh, once, uh, and um, you know, and, and you could just tell that uh, his name was Gene Cernan, and he happened to be the last man on the moon. Mm. Uh, he just died maybe a year ago or so, and uh, we had a little business going, a little business discussion a few years, uh, you know, not a few years ago, but uh, you know, all these guys are military pilots for the most part. They're real, uh, the right stuff guys. And y you talk for the, to, to this guy for 20 seconds, and you know, he's not going to BS anyone about we did this on a movie set. He, he, just, he wouldn't right. do it. He wouldn't do it. Hmm. Um, and, and that's the impression I've got, that these guys would have come forth if, if that were the case. Yes. yes. Um, so you, you talk about a, a, a scary encounter that, that troops had in Korea. Mm -hmm. Back, in, back right. in 1951, when they they were in the middle of a firefight, right. Uh, this is one of the few instances that we uh, were able to come across where what we would call UFO takes some kind of hostile intent. Uh, so there's this um, <clears throat> battle going on with the U.S. troops are kind of like in the high ground, and the communist troops have taken over this village and they're kind of dueling artillery. And um, this thing shows up a orb. Um, you know, orange, uh, unlike anything that, that, you know, anyone's ever seen before. And um, so both sides start shooting at it, which was a mistake because uh, it emitted this ray and uh, hit the American soldiers, uh, this ray. And a lot of these soldiers, it turned out, you know, two or three days later had to be medevaced out of there and had some kind of odd 
problem issues with their white blood cells, a lot of them, you know, it, it stayed with them for the rest of their lives. Uh, you know, what happened, who knows? We don't know, you know, but, you know, once again, it's one of those instances in, in, in this book and in the UFOs and wartime book, I, I, I can tell you, I can count on one hand how many instances uh, that UFOs showed any kind of hostile intent towards us. In the most part, all, you know, for the vast majority of the UFOs just seem to be watching us, seem to be observing us, yeah. uh, not interfering. That's why, you know, one of the theories we come up with, not mine to begin with, but that I'm um, becoming a firm believer in, not a firm believer, but possible that they're time tourists just coming back from our future, mm. coming back to see history being made, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, that, but that happened in Korea, yeah. There was some kind of like, kind of a three-way firefight going on. And uh, you also talk about the haunted highway in Australia. This this one always I found fascinating. <clears throat> right, right. Uh, there's a there's a, um, a highway that goes from I think central Australia to the western part of Australia that goes through this desert. It's called the the Nullarbor Highway. I think it's how you say it. I'm not sure. Null being nothing, Arbor being there's no trees. And it's supposedly the straightest highway in the world because there's no reason to have a, a, a curve or anything. It just goes straight. Mm -hmm. So people usually travel it uh, in cars and stuff at night because it's just brutally hot there. Now, it's also in an area where the British military, that's where they tested their nuclear weapons down in Australia. And supposedly they did it over Aborigine, uh, you know, um, sacred grounds, who knows. But... Um, Lots of incidents have happened along this highway, so much so that they that the local government set up a sign saying, you know, literally beware of UFOs the next 250 miles or something. Um, uh, you know, one instance was this family that were they were driving, uh, I think, from Perth maybe to the middle of Australia, whatnot, and, and um, you know, this thing came down right on their car, started hitting the top of their car. Um, you know, it caused them a flat, a flat tire. They had to change the flat tire. They saw this thing kind of zipping back and forth, um, scared the heck out of them. Turned out that other people saw it too. Thank God for them. And um, <laughs> uh, so you you travel this highway at your own risk. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that one where it like actually attached to the top of their car and started picking right. it up? Yeah, yeah, picking it up and a terrible smell and the works. You know, just a yeah. terrifying. Um. We're getting near the end here. One of the things I did want to ask you that's not in the book, what are your thoughts on the whole To the Stars Academy and all that stuff that's been coming out over the last couple of years? Um, yeah, well, I can say that I'm not familiar with it. How's that? Oh, really? Okay. What is that? Is that the Skinwalker Ranch people and no, all that stuff? No, that is, that is the, uh, the military, the, the basically the government group studying UFOs. Tom DeLong is a part yeah, of it. Yeah, I mean... Uh, it, 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 it's been odd, you know, I mean, since the uh, Tic Tac video, you yeah, know. Yeah, that, that stuff. Right. But see, here's the thing in that, too, is that uh, I, I don't know why the Navy would come out and say that. That's my biggest, you know, question mark. Because those those videos have been, you know, kicking around the Internet for years. Yeah. And and now all of a sudden, you know, this, it was actually December 18th, I think it was a year ago, two years ago now. Two um, years. Two years ago. Where all of a sudden, boom, they're on TV, there's, there's, they're, on, they're everywhere. Uh, you have the Navy pilots talking about it. Uh, you have the New York Times doing a story on it, um, and so on and so forth. You know, and it's like, well, why all of a sudden now? Just so, uh, you know, once again, I don't want to be, you know, that guy at the party, but the buzzkill. But um, when I saw it on ABC, uh, someone said, you got to see this. So I, I turned to ABC Morning News, and... They show it, and I'm lo I'm watching this thing. I'd never seen it before, and I'm going, "Wow, this is unbelievable! What is this?" And then they go back to you know the bubblehead newscasters, and one of the bubblehead you know news women says, "Oh, I thought I saw the Millennium Falcon there," and everyone laughs. You know how that goes, you mm -hmm. know, on those morning news shows. Now, if you want to be really conspiratorial, that's ABC. ABC owns uh, Walt Disney. Basically, owns ABC, and Walt Disney just took over the Star Wars thing, right. and that day, the first Walt Disney Star Wars movie came out. You know? Put the, mm. the, put the dotted lines together. Well, that, but I still no, don't know that, why that, the Navy would go along with it. The Navy going along with it is, is the thing that I can't figure out. Why would they be involved? 
I, I, I think they've had the, the Star Wars franchise more than two years, though. I think that was the first movie that they came out. Or maybe it was one of their movies that came out. It, it would have been one of them, yeah. Yeah, but this woman said, oh, I thought I saw the Millennium Falcon, which everyone laughs at, which once again brings up the ridicule factor, the fact that that's been around UFOs forever. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, it's, it's, maybe she's just trying to suck up to her bosses. I don't know. <laughs> it's an odd thing, to, and an odd coincidence that the movie comes out the day that this right. video well, yeah, yeah. Um. So how advanced, like, like when you see something like the Tic Tac video, do you think that could be something of ours that they're 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 trying to get reactions from? You know, like well, to try and try and disguise, sort of. Yeah, maybe. I mean, they were ten years old. Okay, so whatever that was is already obsolete. Um, hmm. I don't think the Navy would come. I think somewhere along the line, someone would say to the Navy, uh, you know, ixnay on this. You know, don't say anything about this. Uh, if that was what they were up to. Um, you know, now we'd like to think that every part of the military knows what every other part of the military is doing. That's not necessarily so. Um, I'm just reading a book now on DAPA, which has, uh, you know, done all these, like, crazy things. They're like the mad scientists of the Pentagon. You never know what they're up to. They're always just up to really odd, odd stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Well, I don't know. You don't have to think anyone else. How far ahead do you think is the technology that they have now that we don't know about from what we do know about? Right. Well, you know, at some point, very soon, we're going to have to get away from uh, what we would call, like, the internal combustion way of flying and stuff, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, burning fuel and stuff like that is just so inefficient. Uh, You know, even for airplanes, they, they just, you know, they carve off just, a little bit of the wing let, you know, and the plane can get, you know, two more miles a gallon or something. You know, that's, it's really not the way to go about it. Um, you know, they have to find out some way to, you know, move without, you know, uh, having a costly machine around. You know, it, that would be on Earth and in outer space. <clears throat> Obviously, if we're meant to explore the galaxy, we're not going to do it in rocket ships. It just isn't the way to go. It, it takes you know, 20,000 years to get to the next star. Right. Um, right. We have to find a way to move differently, and it, whether it's through wormholes or, you know, something we don't know about yet. <clears throat> we have to do that. You can be sure they're working on it. You know, this whole idea that you can kind of build an anti-magnetic field around you that that you're not encumbered by all the other stuff nature throws at you, gravity-wise and stuff. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It sounds good to me, but, <laughs> you know, we don't know until where's the proof, you know. Yeah, yeah, and thirty years from now, we'll start seeing some of that stuff trickle out to the to the to us. <laughs> well, see, there's the thing is that I don't think it'll trickle out. That's 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 my biggest argument against that. We don't have any of this stuff because, you know, we always think it's the military is going to capitalize on this stuff. No, it's going to be industry. It's going to mm-hmm. be industry. You know, it's it's going to be commercialized. That's where the money is. You know, that's where the power is. You know, you have an anti grab device. You know, it's going to be ra- it's going to be made by <clears throat> Amazon or Google or something. <laughs> you know, fair enough. We'll all have them. Um, so you you have your podcast, and uh, that's weekly. Uh, yep, Mac Maloney's Military X Files show, where you know, radio, internet radio. We also run Armed Forces Radio Network, and we do a podcast. Um, they tell me just to tell people to go to Podbean. Dot com. And we're on YouTube. I mean, we're on iTunes, we're on Stitcher, and Google. We're on 15 different platforms, so we're easy to find. Okay. And, and your fiction work, um, you have a series, right? Right. I have a couple of series going now, Wingman series, uh, which I've been doing for a long time. I'm, I'm just starting to work on uh, Wingman uh, 20. Wingman 19 came out October 10th. Um, just a series about uh, post World War Three fighter pilot, Zen fighter pilot, the best fighter pilot ever, Hawk Hunter, and just a lot of people have been following it for years. Uh, you know, lucky me. And then um, just started a new series called uh, Code Name Starman, uh, which is a uh, story about a military investigator with just a little bit of ESP. First hmm. book came out uh, last week called The Collision of Coffee Kiss. It's it's just kind of like a slightly paranormal military detective series. Nice. Uh, yeah. So, yep. A lot of typing. <laughs> I bet. Are they are they self released? 
No, 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 no. They're okay. um, by uh, yeah. Just go on Amazon or go to any bookstore. To get okay. All right. And uh, what did this book come out on that we've been talking about? Uh, say that again. What? what oh who? yeah. Uh, on the universe, yeah, on Amazon, just the uh, best place. They tell us not to say this, you know, right? Is but just go to Amazon, you know. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to put bookstores out of business either, but you know, you can call, you can, you know, a lot of this is ebooks, and you know, yeah. push a button, you have the book, and then uh, you know they'll print your own personal copy of the book. Amazon will, and they'll be in the mail the next day. So, okay, so this this was self. You put this one out yourself? No, 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 no. no okay, no, the publisher is uh, speaking volumes. Okay. Um, which is mostly known for um, you know, audio recordings and stuff. Blackstone Audio did the recording for it. So, um, uh, yeah, no, no publishers and, you know, all the hassle that comes with that. <laughs> all right. I shouldn't Max. say that. I should, that's really biting the, feet, the hand that feeds me. I shouldn't say that. It's pleasant. Every minute of it is pleasant. <laughs> well, thank you for spending some time with us on this. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, we really appreciate it. I want to thank all of our Patreons, without whom this show may not even be possible. And I particularly want to give a shout out to those pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Eric Hervin, Lindsay Marie Trebet, Super Inframan, Tim, Rob Drummond, Alex Whitcomb, Edu Kamahort, Elliot Keegan, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Maria, Jennifer Campbell, American Rambler, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Yorg, Matthias Sumby, Dominic O'Malley, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Ray Benedetto, Lindsay Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Shrek, Patricia Gaia Quinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris is a hot dog a sandwich, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. All right. I want to apologize for the, the audio quality of this week's show. Uh, Mac and I tried to do it on Skype, and for some reason he could not hear me on his end. Uh, everything seemed to be working fine. We tried for quite a while before finally resulting to his home phone. Um, so that's why it sounded a little thinner than normal. And yet it still dropped out a few times, which is uh, there must have been something going on with Skype. But there is a Patreon segment. It's about 20 minutes long. We cover some other stuff in his book and uh, some of his personal experiences that he talks about. Um, we're still collecting stories. Uh, I hope to do another listener story show very soon. I know everyone loves those. So uh, if you have a story you want us to talk about on the air, send it to stories at com. That is also the place to... Uh, Write us if you want to come on and talk about your stories. I have a few people I know. I promised I would have them on, and I haven't gotten to it quite yet, but I will. If there's anything else you want to contact us about, use contact at wheredotheroadgo.com. You can go to the website, wheredotheroadgo.com, and everything is linked there. So uh, just go there. You know what? You can also help us out if you uh, rate us, preferably favorably, on whatever you're using to listen to Where Did the Road Go On. Uh, that always helps us uh, get a little more visibility, and that would be awesome. Upcoming, we have uh, we have our show's anniversary. I started this show on January 26th, uh, 2013. So we're coming up on seven years old. Not sure yet who I'm going to have on that uh, anniversary show, but around that time I'm hoping to have Mike Cleland and... Aaron Gullius on to do another uh, UFO history show for the last year. And I'm honestly not aware of a ton of stuff that's happened in this last year in the UFO fields, but I'm sure I'm forgetting a ton of stuff. And uh, maybe you people can remind me. So we have, uh, we don't miss stuff when we do the show. Going to have a few in-studio guests over the next month. And uh, those you'll be able to actually visibly watch on YouTube, if you so wish. And of course, the audio will be up. Everywhere it normally is. It's just there's a little added bonus if you want to go watch it on YouTube. All right. I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. 
and thank you so much for your support.